Hello everyone. Good evening. My name is Sophie Metler Grove and I'm the president of the Smith College Democrats. Welcome to Smith College's Northampton mayoral debate. This is Smith's first ever political candidate debate. The co-president of the Smith Democrats, Elizabeth Connolly, and I spent a lot of time this summer talking about how to make politics accessible to Smith students and young people generally. Voters anywhere in the United States can have access to information about local and national candidates if they choose to seek it. But the reality is that a tiny proportion of registered voters seek out such information. Elizabeth and I believe that for voters to feel invested in an election, to feel excited about the candidates and their vote, they must understand who the candidates are, how the election will directly influence them personally, and how the election will affect their community and their loved ones. The Smith Democrats have extensive experience volunteering for candidates on the national level down to the local level. And we know that the more local an election, the less people know about the candidates and the issues at stake. We also know the importance of these local elections, such as city council or mayor, on people's daily lives. So, as Elizabeth and I were talking about how to energize our peers around this fall's elections, knowing that the elections this year are entirely municipal elections, we were especially cognizant of how important it would be to bring the issues and the candidates to the voters. Many Smith students chose to vote, choose to vote here in Northampton rather than in the communities where we grew up. But even at a politically and community-minded institution like Smith, very few of us know who the candidates are and the key political issues in these municipal elections. Our goal for tonight's debate is threefold. Bringing the two mayoral candidates, Michael Bardsley and David Knockwitz, to Smith College, our hope is that, the Smith, that Smith students will have the opportunity to learn about who these two candidates are, the differences between them, and what influence a city mayor has on a small institution like Smith. Secondly, we want Smith to play a role in the larger community and local politics. Finally, we hope to open the conversation about who we want our next mayor to be and how we want the wonderful city of Northampton to evolve. At Smith, we're lucky to have an active and involved government department as well as a wonderful partner in the Smith College Republicans, the Ward 4 Association, and Leah Allen. Without their gracious support, tonight's debate would not have been possible. So, without further ado, I would like to welcome a Smith professor who I hold in great esteem, Government Professor Howard Gold. So he said, I'm Howard Gold. I'm the chair of the government department at Smith College. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to this debate tonight. Uh, Sophie explained very eloquently uh, why uh, the Smith Democrats decided to hold this debate. Um, I, I teach courses in American electoral politics here at Smith. And when we talk about um, campaigns, we often describe debates as the high point of election campaigns. They are potentially the best opportunity for voters to size up the candidates. Um, from my point of view, our purpose in staging this debate at Smith College is to try to engage Smith students who spent four years in Northampton in the civic life of the community, and also to help Northampton voters make an informed choice when they vote for mayor. Uh, before I introduce the candidates, I want to thank Sophie Mettler Grove, president of the Smith Democrats, for her work in organizing this debate. Sophie did just about everything. She, she did all the work. She organized the debate. Uh, um, she came up with the idea during the summer. She did all the organizing, she found co-sponsors, she booked the room, she contacted, she met with the campaigns, and much more. And so she deserves it. I'd also like to thank <clears throat> Leah Allen of the Smith Government Department and Kristen Cole of Smith College Relations for their help in organizing and publicizing this event. Uh, our candidates have long and distinguished biographies. But my introduction to them is going to be very brief. You can, of course, you can of course find much more detailed uh, biographical information about the candidates on their respective websites. So, Michael Bardsley on my immediate right, uh, the audience's right. Uh, Michael Bardsley is a retired teacher, guidance counselor, and school administrator. He was a member of Northampton City Council for 16 years, including eight years as city council president. And on my far right, David Narkowitz, the audience is left, uh, is a former aide to several members of Congress. 
He's been a member of Northampton City Council for six years and has been City Council President since 2009. He's currently the acting mayor of Northampton. Here are the rules for tonight's debate. Um, each candidate has three minutes to make an opening statement. After the opening statement, I'm going to ask the candidates a series of questions. For each question, each candidate has two minutes to respond, followed by an optional one-minute rebuttal. At the moderator's discretion, subsequent short rebuttals will be permitted. After the initial round of questions, we will take questions from the audience. I will ask questioners to come up to the microphone right here in the middle in front of the candidates to identify themselves and to ask short questions to the point, and we will hold the questioners to that. Again, the candidates will each have two minutes to respond to each question, followed by a one-minute rebuttal uh, for each candidate. At the close of questioning, each candidate will have two minutes for a closing statement. Um, the order for opening and closing statements has been determined by coin toss. Michael Barzu will open first. In the closing round, David Narkowitz will lead off. Uh, are these rules clear? Okay. So I'm going to lead off with a question, and Michael Barzu will respond first uh, with a two-minute... Oh, I'm sorry, no. We're going to start with the opening statements. <laughs> Michael Barzu, three minutes, and then David Narkowitz, three minutes. And am I coming through okay on this? Yeah. yeah. No, okay. Um, I want to thank the Smith Democrats, the Smith Republicans, and the Smith Government Department, as well as Ward 4 Northampton, for sponsoring uh, tonight's forum. A frequently asked question is why I am running for mayor. The answer is simple and perhaps a bit corny, but it's because I really love this community. I'm not driven by a political agenda or a personal or personal ambitions. Only by a desire to be a public servant for the citizens of this community. As I stated two years ago, my overarching concern for Northampton's future is that it is becoming increasingly difficult for working middle class individuals and families to live here. In the past year, there have been several key events that have highlighted the plight of the working middle class. Wisconsin's attack on public employee unions, the Verizon strike, uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement. All these attest to the fact that the working middle class is feeling financially squeezed and politically alienated. These issues are being played out here in Northampton as they are elsewhere in the United States, but perhaps a little differently. The liberal or progressive label that Northampton often uses very proudly is due mostly to its outstanding track record on human and civil rights, specifically sexual orientation. Northampton is far less comfortable in dealing with issues related to class. I often hear labels like HAMP versus NOHO, liberal versus conservative, Democrat versus Republican, none of which help to clarify the real issue and all of which create confusion and further division. Working middle class folks here in Northampton are feeling increasingly alienated, ignored, and dismissed. Those in power are perceived as being an, an elite who think they know what is best for Northampton and are perceived as possess possessing a great deal or great sense of privilege. To me, this is the issue that is most significant for the leaders of this city to grapple with as we try to chart a course for the city's future. And I think I am the candidate who understands this issue, is listening to the people, and will say focus on resolving this issue. Thank you. David Narkowitz. Thank you. I want to begin by thanking the uh, Smith Democrats, Ward 4 Northampton, Smith Republicans. Uh, move the mic closer. It doesn't seem like it's on. Is it, is it working? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Sorry about that. 
Uh, I want to begin by thanking the Smith Democrats, the Ward 4 Northampton, the Smith Republicans, and the Government Department for sponsoring tonight's debate, and for all of you for coming out tonight on a Monday to hear us. Smith College has played an important role in our community, its students, faculty, and staff are a vital part of the fabric of Northampton. I was born and raised in Western Mass in a large working class family of nine kids. My parents taught me the value of hard work and instilled a strong ethic of community and public service. I enlisted in the Air Force after high school and served on active duty and as a member of the Massachusetts Air National Guard. In addition to lifelong lessons about service, discipline, and leadership, my six years in the military gave me valuable training as a personnel specialist and real-world experience managing people, data, and resources in a large and diverse organization. I put myself to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst using my veterans' benefits and by holding as many as three part-time jobs a semester together with summer work. I graduated Phi Beta Kappa with a BA in political science and received several academic and leadership awards. After college, I worked seven years as a staff member for the U.S. House of Representatives. This included time in Washington, D.C. as a legislative assistant, advising members of Congress on a broad range of policy and budget issues. It also included serving as Congressman John Oler's <laughs> District Economic Development Director, working to bring federal support to communities across western Massachusetts and leading a staff based in three offices throughout our district. The best groundwork for the position of mayor, however, might have been my next job, stay-at-home dad. When we started our family, I stayed home with our children so my wife could finish her medical training and begin her successful career. It was the most challenging and rewarding job I've had. And while my focus was on my family, it, immersed, it also allowed me to immerse myself in neighborhood and community issues and allowed me to serve the city through sustained work with organizations like the Northampton Education Foundation and volunteering in my kids' schools and serving on city boards, including the Zoning Board and the Transportation and Parking Commission. In 2005, my neighbors in Ward 4 elected me their representative to the City Council. In 2009, the City elected me Councilor at Large, and my colleagues elected me President of the City Council. I've worked with people across Northampton on issues including transportation, energy, education, economic development, the budget, and government reform. I've created policies and programs aimed at keeping our community strong. I've also learned the nuts and bolts of how our city functions, and an understanding and appreciation of the challenges we face as a community. My experience at the federal, state, and local level, combined with my record of community volunteerism and my city council service, has unique, uniquely prepared me to lead Northampton. I am a candidate with a positive vision and a proven record of leadership and results who can move our great city forward. I look forward to this evening's conversation and the opportunity to share my views and my vision on the important issues facing our city. Thanks you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to now turn to the round of questioning. Uh, um, I'm going to ask the candidates a series of questions. Uh, they're both going to, they're each going to answer every question. Uh, uh, by coin toss, Michael Barsley will answer the first question first. Michael, you'll have two minutes, uh, and then David, you'll have two minutes afterwards, followed by optional one minute rebuttals. Okay. Um, in the October 5th Hampshire Gazette, Reporter Dan Crowley wrote after the first debate at Northampton High School that, and I quote, Barsley and Arkwood squared off in the first debate and seemed hard pressed to differentiate themselves. Unquote. In the last debate, the sharpest differences between the two of you had to do with campaign tactics. Are the major differences between the two of you only stylistic and tactical? Do they only relate to experience and personal qualities? Or are they substantive? <coughs> My question is this, could you each tell us what the specific major policy differences are between you and your opponent? Michael, two minutes. Thank you. Um, as I think reflected in my opening statement, you know, there are substantial uh, differences, I believe, in our stance on the issue. Um, I am very concerned with what is happening within our community in terms of uh, working middle class people. I made that statement uh, two years ago, and I remember in a debate, my opponent at the time uh, suggested that I was trying to promote class warfare here in Northampton. Um, that is, at the time. Uh, the, um, the, uh, I think the issues that have happened uh, and that I referred to uh, throughout the, the, the country is showing that there was substance to that concern. And it's not that I 
am somebody who cannot predict the future. It's just that I have pretty good listening skills, and I have heard that from people who live in this community, and I'm in touch with that. So that is a, a major driving concern of mine, is to look at the economic diversity of this community. And I'm one of the few people who talk about that issue and have worked on that issue. So that is something I think is a major, major difference. And using that as a starting point, that uh, definitely affects how I look at issues around budget, around financing, around economic development. I think that's a driving point that makes a major difference. I am very concerned that this community is headed towards becoming uh, an elitist community, a divided community. And I think we need to really con be concerned with uh, the issues of working middle class people and families in this community. Thank you. Thank you. David. Uh, I, I don't really think that that is a major difference because those are issues that I care about and those are issues that I've talked about in the campaign. Uh, this issue of how do we keep our city affordable for all residents? You know, how do we keep this a place that everyone can afford to live, to work, to retire? Um, so I'm not so sure that that is a major distinction. What I do think is a distinction is our approach to how you solve a problem like that. How do you approach these things? And the thing that I've talked about a lot during the campaign is don't just listen to my rhetoric. Listen to the things that I've done as a city councilor. Listen to the ideas that I've put forth for how you solve those things. So in this issue of you know, how do we keep Northampton affordable for people? I mean, one of the issues that I've worked on uh, is, you know, how do we make it more affordable for people to live in their homes, whether it's we, we change zoning regulations to make it easier for people to expand their homes rather than having to move somewhere else if they have to bring in a loved one or a family member. Um, how do we look at how do we make people's homes more affordable for them to live in in terms of energy conservation? About three weeks ago, I worked with my colleague, uh, Councillor Marianne Labarge, to sponsor an event out in Ward 6 where we focused on some homes that really that, that are, were built at a time when there wasn't a good insulation, when they're based on electric heat. These are very difficult homes for people to be able to afford to heat. So we are trying to put forth positive solutions for, okay, how do we give them the tools, how do we give them the resources, how do we plug them into you know, the utility companies to help them uh, make the change so that they can make those homes more affordable, more comfortable, uh, and easier to live in. So my, uh, my campaign is about put together positive solutions for how we're going to solve these problems. You can identify the problem, and I think we all understand that that's a problem. It's what's happening nationwide. It's what the Occupy Wall Street movement is all about. The question is, how do we deal with that problem responsibly here at the local level? And how do we pull people together to be able to figure out the solutions for how we're going to deal with it? And I think this community, I, I don't see that great divide. I, I, what I see is a community where we have a lot of shared values, a lot of shared beliefs. We look out for each other, and I think as a community, we can all work together to try to solve some of the problems like that. Michael, do you want to uh, respond? Yes. Um, well, if David doesn't see the great divide, then he's missing the point. Um, there is a great divide. That is what drove people to um, occupy Wall Street on a $5 a, uh, a month fee, and uh, which is less than the, the, for most families here than the proposed increase for or the retention of the CPA, which is creating a lot of tension in this community. So it is, uh, there is an issue here. I don't think it can be dismissed like that. You, we need to listen to people and work with people. And I think that's what is missing. You know, um, the, the, the uh, solutions that David rattled off are not necessarily what people are saying and what people are talking about. You have to listen to the people and work with them to come up with meaningful solutions. And that's what's missing. I have the history of doing that, but working with people, listening to people. Well, I, I'm hoping that people in the audience listen to my first answer, which was I was not dismissing that as an issue. I was actually trying to talk about it in a, in a constructive way and say, okay, we're here at the local level. This is kind of like where the rubber meets the road. And we're making the kinds of decisions about our budgets, about how we're going to keep people's streets plowed, how we're going to provide police service, how we're going to provide fire service, how we're going to provide good schools. Those are the issues that we need to grapple with. And how do we keep the city affordable in the midst of all that? And th that's the conversation that I want to lead as mayor, is how do we do that in a way that's responsible? And how do we do that in a way that does listen to all those concerns and all of those uh, different voices in the community and tries to represent them all.
And I think that's the approach. Again, I think we both understand the problem. I think everyone in this room understands the problem. The question is, who is the person that can bring people together to try to lead the city in a positive direction to solve some of those issues? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to proceed to another question. Um, this one, David Nard will respond, will respond to you first. Since this debate is taking place on the Smith campus, I'd like to ask you a question about Smith and Northampton. Like many college towns, there has long been talk of a town gown divide in Northampton. What are the main issues that you see dividing the town of Smith College? For me, I think, uh, I think the big issue is, is, is communication. Um, between the two entities. I think we have a lot of shared interests. I think that obviously um, Smith controls a lot of land. I think there's, yeah, bring the mic oh, close. Sorry about that. Uh, so I think the, it, one of the big issues is communication in terms of the city and Smith, um, particularly Smith, um, letting the, be, being a, a partner with the city in terms of letting us know what their vision is, what their planning vision. I think some of the tensions that have arisen around the, the town gown relationship has been a feeling that the college has sort of been closed in terms of its internal planning, the things that it's going to do. Um, and, and those decisions affect the city of Northampton. They affect us because we're, you know, we're part of the community. Um, they do impact us. So I think one of the things that I would try to work on as mayor in terms of that relationship is try and create more opportunities for Smith um, and the city to be able to communicate around some of these shared issues, and I think this whole issue of planning and around you know what the what the uh, what the college's plans are vis-a-vis -vis what the city's uh, vision and, and plans are for itself, and how we can try to make sure that uh, we're respectful of each other and that we're able to sort of uh, work collaboratively when it's possible, but that that we both have a seat at the table and that we both understand you know what the shared interests are um, for each of us. Michael? From the, uh, the town's uh, point of view on, on that issue, I, I think there's a uh, feeling, a very strong feeling, that Smith is often disconnected from um, the, the citizens, especially uh, residents who live uh, nearby, and a number of its issues don't really consider the impact on them. Um, uh, one example of it is this very building with the perception that the back side of the building faces Elm Street, which is the main thoroughfare of, of the city. Um, and that, that was a, a point of the, uh, kind of discussion and debate at one point in time when this building was being proposed. Another very heated example, and that was a turning point, um, is uh, the uh, gradual uh, dismantling of the Belmont uh, West Street uh, neighborhood and as that gets uh, acquired by Smith and pulled into the, to the campus and the loss that that means to Northampton is a it's a again it was a neighborhood that was very affordable for a lot of working people and single people and a lot of those people have been displaced and continue to be displaced from that neighborhood and many of them end up leaving, uh, leaving the city and that has a real impact on the character and the character of the city. Uh, and another um, uh, issue of that related to that was the whole Smith Overlay District and the impact that that had on surrounding neighborhoods. So I, I think that uh, in, as we continue the dialogue into the discussion is to push, it, uh, push the point on Smith that they really have an impact on the lives of everyday people for them to understand that so we can uh, come up with some different uh, solutions than we've had in the past. David, do you want to uh, respond? Or? No, just, just to add, I, mean, I think that, again, the, my point was about this idea that we have to communicate better. I, I served as chair of the Transportation and Parking Commission, and parking has been a major concern in and around the college. That's been a perennial concern. And so one of the things that we did uh, during that process, it was actually an offshoot of the of the development agreement was trying to get Smith to put together uh, a transportation demand management plan so that they could actually look at things like zip cars and look at things like um, rearranging their lots and look at things like having uh, faculty, limiting faculty permits uh, and providing incentives for people not to drive. That's a shared interest with the city. We have those same interests because we also have transportation demand management issues. I thought that was a perfect opportunity for us to work together on an issue uh, where we have a shared interest. 
And that was something that I tried to do. And I think that's sort of an example of the kinds of things that we should be doing on lots of issues, on, on big planning issues, on future planning issues, and how it impacts uh, both of us, uh, as opposed to being on parallel tracks and then being, suddenly being surprised uh, at what the other is doing. Um, I think we should, they're part of the city, we should try to integrate those efforts. Thank you. Well, um, looking at uh, Smith and the, uh, the terms of that we, uh, uh, terminology we, we've heard recently in Occupy uh, Wall Street, um, Smith probably uh, more than many, many other institutions in the, uh, the city is viewed as a um, sort of a, a face or a product of corporate America and as a representative of, of the 1%. And we may not look at that in terms of it being a very a generous liberal institution in terms of education and cultural things, but in terms of decision making and the impact of the neighborhood, a lot of the, the, the working people who have been affected by that, it's feeling that impact, and that's the face that, that they often see. And if you can't understand that, then there's a, there's a discrepancy there as well. Thank you. Uh, next question, Michael Barzi will respond to you first. The public schools in Northampton suffer from chronic underfunding. One possible solution would be the closing of one of the city's four public elementary schools. Do you think we have the right number of elementary schools in Northampton? Can you envisage a scenario under which we would close one of the elementary schools? Michael? I was very clear on this two years ago. I am staunchly opposed to closing any of the uh, elementary schools based on the information that we have at this time in terms of um, uh, student needs and the, uh, the size of the uh, uh, student population. Um, it would have a devastating impact on whatever portion of the community would, were to lose that um, elementary school. And I think we have to commit ourselves to doing what is necessary to keep all four elementary schools open. Um, last time around, the, uh, the, the focus shifted to Ryan Road Elementary School up in Ward 6. And at the time of the uh, debates two years ago, the, uh, the proposal was to uh, close Ryan Road Elementary School and at the same time expand the uh, uh, the landfill over the aquifer. That was sort of like a gift to Ward 6. And that happens to have a uh, historically a very heavy working class population up there. And they were feeling very uh, kind of left out again of the discussion and the, uh, the decision making. So I think we need to make a commitment to uh, do what is necessary, do what is possible to maintain all four elementary schools because the removal of any single one of them is going to have a devastating effect to that part of the community, uh, whether it's Bridge Street or uh, uh, Jackson Street or, or Ryan Road or the Leeds. So, um, uh, as I said two years ago, I'm, uh, I'm a staunch uh, supporter of the four elementary schools. Yeah, um, I, I took that same position in 2009. Um, and just by way of background, I have two kids that uh, went through, the, are in the schools. They actually were in Bridge Street School at the time this conversation was happening. Bridge Street was also one of the schools that was being considered. Um, I think the data has shown, and there's been new data produced since, particularly with the census data that's come out, um, that really, at the current time, the four-school model is still appropriate for Northampton. It's also appropriate because now we're actually expanding many of the uses of our schools. So, for example, uh, we've uh, created a, a, you know, a preschool program um, that's now focused at, at Bridge Street School. Uh, we have a specialized autism program uh, that's, I believe, at uh, Jackson Street School. We're in negotiations with Clark School to actually put a Clark uh, School satellite at the lead school. Um, and we have a Head Start program now at Ryan Road School. So schools are now becoming much more than just elementary schools. We're finding other building uses. So at the current structure, um, I don't think there's any justification for closing one of our schools. That said, we used to have many more elementary schools in Northampton. We had smaller neighborhood schools, and that model was effective. Um, so going forward, as we, as we think about this issue, I think the bottom line has to be 
how do we provide the best education for our kids in the city? That always has to be the driving force. So, you know, I think this is something that we have to keep evaluating and looking at and thinking about what's the best model. But I think right now, the model that we have, the four neighborhood-based elementary schools given the population, uh, is the correct one. Um, and I support uh, and I support keeping the four elementary schools open. But again, um, I'm, uh, I'm not going to make a no new taxes pledge. I'm not going to say it's never going to happen because I'm sure somebody you know, 10 years ago said the same thing about you know Florence Grammar or said the same thing about South Street School. And it's something that you have to keep evaluating again with that bottom line thinking that how do we provide the best education for our kids with the resources that we have to do it? What's the best way to deliver? quality public schools. So that would be my approach, both in the short term, but also in the long term. Before I ask for rebuttals, um, let me just ask a follow-up and emphasize the second half of my question, which is sort of, under what conditions could you imagine the need to close one of the four public elementary schools? Um, Michael, you go first. Well, it's hard for me. Uh, it would be a, a significant decrease in the, in the population of the, uh, the elementary school. Um, that, that is the only way I could imagine uh, uh, doing that. Um, in terms of uh, David's response, he may have indeed taken a, a position to keep the, the Ryan Road School open in uh, the last round of uh, debates during the election season. Um, but I. Um, in my work with the parents, I don't think they heard that very clearly. Um, a lot of people were uh, convinced that I was the only voice, of, along with the, their ward counselor, who was taking a position of keeping that school open. So I have, in my working with uh, the, the parents there, um, they didn't hear that then loudly and clearly from me. David? Well, I, I sat in Ryan Road School in a debate in 2009 and was asked the question and I gave the answer that I just gave you, so I'm not sure how much clearer I could have been at the time, but that was my response. In terms of a scenario, I mean, uh, you know, part of the issue of you've got two different things that drive education funding. You've got, um, you know, the staff, the teachers, the, you know, the, the, the expense, that expense, and then you also have the physical plant, you have the cost to heat a school, you have the cost to, to maintain a school, you have, you know, you have to have an administrative staff and, and Secretarial and nurse. So each of these schools has a different set of moving parts budget wise. So I think the scenario that could happen is if our enrollment got to be got down to such a level that you know we were really it was not as cost effective to be paying overhead on you know those four buildings, then I think that would be a scenario. And in fact that is the scenario how we got to four schools. We used to have many more elementary schools and, and as as things changed and as our population changed and the way school costs increase, that was why we moved to the four elementary school model. So I mean, that's the scenario that you do it. And if you're, you know, you have to be responsible. You have to, if you're concerned about how you provide the best education, you're always going to be reevaluating that. Um, but again, I think at the current time, that scenario doesn't exist. But that would be the scenario under which you have to make that decision. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next question is for David Narcos. Um, how do you respond to charges made by some of your critics that Mayor Higgins struck a backroom deal with you to resign before the end of her term so as to give you an advantage as incumbent mayor going into the campaign? Uh, well, if there was a deal, I got the raw end of it, I think. Because, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm trying very hard to run a campaign for mayor, which I announced, you know, many, many months uh, before that. Um, I'm also trying to um, be the city council president and maintain all of my duties and my committee work, and I'm also trying to fulfill the duties of acting mayor. And again, back to my opening statement, I ran citywide for election. I was elected overwhelmingly a councilor at large. I, re I was received more votes than the two mayoral candidates, so I feel like I was elected to that position to represent the city. Then my colleagues elected me to be council president, and under the charter of our city, if the mayor is away for a week or two weeks, or if the mayor dies or vacates the office, the city council president becomes the acting mayor. And that's the scenario under which I became uh, acting mayor. Um, in terms of, and, and for no compensation, I will also add, which people um, often ask me about, how am I enjoying that new salary? Uh, there's no salary. I'm doing it um, under my city council's salary. So the key piece here is there's no backroom deal. 
Uh, and again, if it were my choice, I would wish the mayor had served out her term, if it were my choice. Uh, because it's uh, been, it would be far easier for me to run and to be able to talk about my issues and talk about a campaign while not having to also uh, you know, do this other job that I'm trying to do and be very careful about and try not to have it cross over into the campaign and be respectful of the duties and carry them out. And, and by the way, um, the, there's a lot of stuff involved with being the acting mayor. It's quite busy and I'm, and I'm trying to manage that. Um, but I, I, this idea of a backroom deal, um, I was not part of any such deal. The mayor made her decision, was offered a job, and she decided to take it and leave early. And that's the circumstances under which I became acting mayor. Thank you. Michael? I think the, uh, the criticism ties into a, uh, a larger issue, and it's the, uh, the, the perception that a lot of times the major decisions in, in the city are not made in the, uh, the public sessions, but are made outside of the, the, the public sessions. And a lot of times it appears that decisions are not really made on their merits, but are made with other uh, information, or oftentimes uh, political information going into them. And um, the, uh, back in uh, uh, January of 2008, there was an article that appeared in the Gazette and it was talking about the, uh, the changes in uh, city council or president that was about to happen. And the, uh, uh, the, the background scenes around that affecting that, uh, that decision. And I'm not going to go into the article that's been around for a while. People can read that. But it was revealing and it shows that definitely there are other uh, currents that are, that are flowing beneath the surface that represent uh, some of the changes that one can see. It's just not a coincidence, some of these changes. That rumor was uh, very uh, much alive two years ago. As a, as a matter of fact, at one of the debates, uh, Mayor Higgins was asked the question, um, would she commit to serving her two, uh, two years? And she unequivocally said, yes, she would. And the, um, that there are some people who would not have voted for her if they thought she was not going to fill out her term. In fact, she had that as an obligation, and she did not do that. She, she left early. So that is, uh, I think, some of the, uh, the underlying currents around the concerns in such a question. Do you want to uh, exercise a one-minute rebuttal? Okay. Just only to say that um, I'm David Narkowitz, and I'm a candidate for mayor, and I've been a candidate for mayor. And so, I, you know, I can't speak for Claire Higgins. And if uh, you know, if you want to debate Claire Higgins, you've come to the wrong place because I'm David Narkowitz. I'm running for mayor. I feel like I've been running a very active campaign. I've been out all around the city, knocking on doors, uh, talking to people in the kitchens and living rooms about the issues that they're concerned about. Um, and I've been doing it in a way that I think has also been respectful of the duties that I'm also trying to carry out as acting mayor. Um, and, if, uh, and so that's been my approach to it, and that's going to continue to be my approach. And again, if, if uh, folks want to talk about you know, uh, rumors and, and, uh, and 2008 stories, which you know, some of the sourcing of that story uh, was my opponent uh, who was sort of feeding this back then as well. Um, again, what I'm talking about is the here and now, I'm running for mayor, I'm a candidate, I've been very clear about that, and I'm happy to talk about people about real issues and the real concerns that affect this city and how we're going to address them going forward. Michael, one minute. David, your, you know, your answer uh, is um, a little smug at, at times. If there is an issue going around in terms of people and how decisions are made, and, and that's real. And yes, I, I fully realize you're not running against Claire, but two years ago I didn't really run against Claire, there was nothing personal to it. It was around how issues are addressed and solved in, in the city, and that is still an issue. And um, it, it's not just a personality change, there needs to be almost a regime change. There, there's a, uh, there's a, a sense that there is a, a small group of people who have a lot of influence and that things are not open in terms of including a wide range of people in discussing the, uh, uh, the various decisions. So there's no need to take it personally, but that is the, that is the, the uh, perception. We have a, wide, a lot of people in this community who want to be involved in the government, governmental process, and I welcome it.
question is from Michael Barsley. Uh, two minutes, uh, you get two minutes to respond, Dave, you have two minutes after that. Um, how do you respond to charges made by some of your critics that you've debased the campaign by running a negative ad in the October 1st Hampshire Gazette in which you stated in reference to your opponent, quote, I like the idea of the bike, it's the training wheels that bother me. Well, I, I still um, do not uh, feel that it was a negative ad. I felt like it was maybe a, it was an attempt at humor. I had a, a, another ad following that where I was uh, pointed the humor at myself. It was trying to um, uh, shake up the, the thinking and the way people uh, look at the, uh, uh, the issues and with a different approach. Um, the the picture was not a picture that our campaign took. In fact, we, we got it from the media. It came from Northampton Media, as a matter of fact, on their website. Um, and the, um, the the text of it was attempt to be uh, concentrate on me and the differences in experience. So that that was really the focus. So there wasn't name calling. There wasn't blaming. There wasn't false accusation. So I really don't think it's negative in the sense of the, uh, the negative campaigning. Um, there has been plenty of ne negative campaigning and negative comments in the past and even recently. I'm not going to dwell on that. I think it's really important to stay focused on the issues and I think the issues, one of the issues is the level of experience and both in the city government as well as career experience. And I think another one is the, our different perspective on the issues. And that ad, I think, really was intended to highlight the, that, the fact that the raw differences between us. David? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll let other people judge whether they think it was negative or positive. I mean, for me, uh, the way that I've tried to conduct the campaign is to talk about issues, to talk about, you know, you like oh, sorry, to talk about, you know, issues and talk with people about the challenges that we're facing as a city, to talk about my experience, yes, but also to talk about, okay, what are the things that I've done during the time that I've been involved in city government? Uh, real changes, real programs, real policies that I've been able to put in place, and what are the ideas that I have for being the mayor? And what are the things I think I could do as mayor with the leadership skills that I have? Um, uh, you know, that I, that's, wouldn't be an ad that I would run, that's fine. I, I appreciate that that was what he was trying to do in an attempt at humor, but I think the feedback that I got was people appreciated that I was sort of staying uh, positive, I was trying to focus on myself, trying to focus on the issues, and not make it about uh, this sort of putting down of my opponent or saying that they, they you know, they, um, you know, are less qualified, all those kinds of things, but really just focusing on myself. I mean, the way I approach this is, this seat is open for the first time in 12 years. We have the chance to elect a new mayor. Uh, we're essentially applying for a job. We're, we're applying to the voters to say, look, uh, I, I'm the person, I'm the applicant who's the best qualified to serve. So my approach is, I'm going to put forward myself, I'm going to put forward my ideas, I'm going to put forward a positive vision for the city, and if that's what the people want, then that's what they're going to elect. And, and that's the way I'm going to run the campaign, and I'm going to stay true to that, and I'll let other people uh, run campaigns the way they want to run them, and I'll let the voters judge what kind of a campaign that they want to see in the city of Northampton. Thank you. Michael, one minute. Oh. Uh, David can say that he's um, being positive and focusing on, on himself, but people who have uh, listened to, I think, a number of our debates will see that on a number of occasions that you have criticized you know, what I have or haven't done in the past. And, and that's fair game. This is politics after all. So if, if um, I, can, uh, I can take what you've been dishing out, but to say that you have been positive all the time is really off the mark and you have, haven't been solely focusing on yourself. A number of your comments have been biting comments about what you perceive that I haven't, haven't done. So uh, once again, there's a discrepancy for what you say and what you do. Well, I think, I think um, you know, we're, when we're having a policy discussion, we're talking about things like the Smith overlay, for example. Uh, I think it's relevant to point out that, A, uh, you know, I, I was not even on the city council when the Smith Development Agreement was signed, and B, that my opponent was the city council president, was, was second in leadership in the city during that time. And I pointed that out. I think that's a fact. I think that's a relevant fact. 
And so those are the kinds of things that I've tried to do during our debates, is point out some of the differences and some of the, what did you do when you were in a position of leadership to be able to make a difference? Um, I've talked about the things I've done, and in the course of a debate, when I, when I hear uh, an issue talked about by someone who was there, seemingly saying that they weren't there, I think it's fair for me to point that out. I think that's part of a public policy debate. Um, but I've never criticized your bike, I've never criticized the color of your bike, um, and I've never, uh, I've never attacked you in any other way along the lines of, of your bike. <laughs> And for the record, I didn't criticize your bike either. The, uh, for the, uh, uh, but I will uh, correct you once again in your understanding of, of the facts. As the, the agreement that was reached between the city and Smith College was um, negotiated solely by the mayor and by the president of Smith. Uh, no one else even, as far I did not even know those negotiations were going on, was not informed of the results after, until after that agreement was reached. So um, any other input from uh, other elected leaders, the city council, were not included in that. It was solely between the mayor and the president of Smith. And um, it was a take it or leave it as it was tied into the Smith Overlay District. And that is, um, and that was after the fact, um, in terms of responding to that. So that was my concern and my objection, and that's why I was the only no vote on that for that vote for the overlay district. Take a short vote. Uh, and again, I think and this is a conversation we had after that. I think um, in the time that I've been city council president, there have been no major decisions that have been made without me being. Be inserting myself into the process and saying, look, this is a major decision for the city. The city council needs to have a voice in this. And had I been city council president, I don't think you would have seen this, the, the, the thing that occurred over this. Um, I, I would have been in there, I would have been in the mayor's office, I would have said, I want to understand this deal, I want to understand how it impacts the city, and I would have brought it before, I would have brought it to the city council. I would have found a way to do it. And that's, the, that's been my approach since I've been city council president, and I don't think you've seen any of these issues that have occurred while I've been city council president because I've asserted the legislature's uh, authority in the process, and I have not uh, waited till after the fact and said, you know, nobody told me about it, I didn't know about it. Um, I would make sure that I was in there and I was part of that process. And I think that's the difference. Thank you. Okay, um, we have about a half an hour left so we're going to move to the next phase of the yeah. debate, and that is questions from the audience. I'm going to ask people to line up at the mic. I'm going to ask you to identify yourself. You cannot read long statements or speeches. They need to be short questions to the point. We will cut you off if you start speaking too long. And the candidates will have two minutes to respond to each question, followed by one minute rebuttal in the same format. Okay, so um, I ask that you come up to the mic, introduce yourself, and ask your questions. Ask a brief question to the candidates. I'm Jim Levy, and I've known both of you for years. Yeah. Talk right into the mic. All right. Uh, you both talk about your ability to listen, but a mayor going all around the city often hears contradictory input and advice. In your experience, what can tell us that having done the listening, you as a leader would be able to make a decision and stick to it and be prepared to disappoint some of the people that you've listened to? And please use some examples from your time um, as city council. Thank you. David, uh, you'll go first since Michael uh, got the last question first. Well, definitely one of the things uh, when you when you get into elected office, uh, you know, you, you learn very quickly that every decision you make, that there's people that disagree with it, and, and uh, you know, you immediately uh, have people on both sides. Someone's upset with you based on that decision. The way I've tried to approach the decision-making process is to do it in a way that, first of all, I try to hear all the various competing voices. I try to gather all the information that I can about an issue, and then I make a decision. Um, and, and then I try to explain that decision and, so that people understand 
where I come down on the issue and why I took the decision that I made. And I can give lots of examples of that. Um, you know, one, one, uh, uh, one incident that happened or one uh, major issue that happened here in the city was on the override. Very contentious, uh, you know, very contentious issue. People concerned about it. People um, worried about the impacts. Were we able to, to get it passed? I took a leadership role on the override, but I didn't just say, you know, I'm for it. I went out into the community and I talked to people at community forums and I explained my position. When people talked to me about why I supported it, I was very clear that I thought we needed to do it. And I actually made a case for it. And I think after that was over, even people who disagreed still respected the fact that I took a principled position, that it was based on the information that I had gathered, and I made the decision based on that. There are smaller examples. Uh, had a, I had an issue when I was fairly new to the council where there was a situation where city councilors for years have been not only serving on the city council, but had also been serving on regulatory bodies. They've been serving on the Board of Public Works and some of these other, uh, the, the housing authority, other uh, 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 regulatory bodies. I proposed an ordinance to actually end that practice and to say, you know, we really have to have a cleaner separation of government. Um, the, the, the downside of it was it ended up kicking three of my colleagues off of committees, um, which you know was not uh, didn't necessarily make them happy. But I'm proud to say that they respected me at the end of that debate. They respected me because they understood that I was taking a principled position, that it was based on a real concern in the city, and I was able to articulate it clearly. And I'm also proud to say that those three councilors all support me for mayor. Um, and so I think that's some examples. Big decisions, small decisions, where the approach that I take, the way that I'm very uh, judicious and I research issues, that I'm then able to make a clear decision that people understand, uh, and then we can move on to the next decision. Michael. All too often in the, um, in the city, the, uh, the, the decision making um, starts with a proposal already being made. When I was in a high school, I taught um, decision making in one of the, my courses and you start with making a decision kind of open-ended you do a lot of the brainstorm you do a lot of the input and then you narrow the process all too often in this city it starts narrow and then people come and then they start bringing their concerns and objections with, with the uh, with the decision making and at the end in this city a lot of times there's a lot of contention around that where people feel like they've been left out of, of the process the decision has been made um, though you know the day, the examples David used are, I consider relatively safe examples some of the more controversial decisions have been around the uh, the expansion of the landfill over the aquifer the uh, the proposal to build the hotel downtown um, and the educational overlay district right here with, with Smith and in each of those cases, with the information that the councilors were initially given, it seemed to, to make sense. But then as people came forward with their concerns and raising issues, it, it, it changed for me the nature of the, uh, the, the debate and the concern. And in each of those instances, I was on the, uh, the minority of, of a vote. I believe I was the only person who uh, expressed uh, concerns on the council about the hotel and voted against it. I was the only uh, no vote on the overlay district, and along with uh, Marianne Labarge and um, and Ray Labarge, uh, bless his memory, that we were the three people who were concerned with the overlay, and that those positions came over time as as citizens came forward. So I have a history of having the courage to stand up and taking an unpopular position on very, very controversial issues. Thank you. And here's one of those cases where I have to do a fact check, and that is that, first of all, there was no vote on the hotel, and in fact, my, my opponent uh, was very publicly stated in the early phases that he thought a hotel was a great idea. Um, so he was before it, before he was against it. Um, so the other issue that I, uh, in terms of this issue is, um, uh, about the decision making is, you know, a mayor also has to make a lot of very quick decisions, decisions that come every day, um, as I can tell you, whether it's personnel decisions, whether it's hiring decisions, whether it's um, budgetary decisions that have to be made um, very quickly. You have a lot of information coming at you. 
Um, so yes, for these bigger issues, we have to have a process, but a mayor also has to be able to process information, to have a, a really good depth of knowledge of policy issues, to be able to understand the inner workings of the city, and to also be able to make some of those rapid fire decisions that happen. And I think that's also an important skill that I have and that I'll bring to the job as well. Yes, um, you know, David's little uh, quip there that I was against it, or I was before it, before I was against it. Can you represent something that, um, that I witnessed a lot recently and, and, and previous to this in terms of kind of a, um, an attitude where you're, you're flipping uh, the facts and trying to make a kind of a gotcha little point. And that, we should be beyond that, David. It's not whether or not the, uh, I was for something at one time and then changed my mind. I made it very clear that as people came forward with different perspectives on this proposal, that that had changed, that changed the nature of the debate. And whether or not we took a vote on it, I was the one, I was one of the councilors um, going to the planning board meeting and speaking against it. So, um, try, trying to uh, gain uh, you know, favor for yourself or by making a, a little um, smart remark like that to me does not um, benefit the city or, or either of us. Thank you. Let's move on to the next question. Brief, identify yourself, please. My name, is, yeah, my name is Joel Spire, I'm Ward 3. And over the last eight or ten years, I've been working on liberal democratic causes and for liberal democratic candidates. And so I'm concerned about workers and I'm concerned about social issues. I'm also concerned about resources and jobs. Resources and jobs, jobs and resources. I'd like to know in the future, what are the candidates going to do to bring jobs to Northampton and to bring revenues to Northampton so they can take care of the needs we really need for the working class, who I care a lot about? Thank you. I couldn't agree with you more, Joel. Um, I'm, uh, I share that uh, concern. Um, we, uh, one of the things that needs to be done is the whole economic development uh, uh, program that we have needs to be looked at and reshaped and refocused. If you look at our uh, budget book and look at the economic development uh, uh, department, it doesn't seem to have a clear focus. And so we really need to have that focus. Um, there are a number of things that can be done even, even before that, but uh, there's a number of things that I would do. One is I would uh, champion a higher uh, local campaign. Uh, a lot of the jobs that we have, whether they're construction jobs or jobs around uh, PR campaigns or, or um, in terms of um, graphic artists and a lot of things that are related to publicity campaigns that some of the major institutions like Smith have, they go outside of the community with that work. So I would do a consciousness raising with some of the employees here and champion a higher local campaign. Um, I would also uh, work very hard to bring more green jobs in here um, and the, also uh, work very hard to support our local businesses. Um, there's been a lot of effort made to support some of our uh, the multinational and national businesses in Northampton and I think that's good for economic balance. But we need to support, equally support our local businesses. That has not been done. I have gone around to the businesses downtown um, as well as in Florence, downtown Northampton and downtown Florence. And I have heard, I've listened to those folks, they do not feel supported by the city. There's a huge disconnect. Uh, two of our very uh, long time businesses in downtown Northampton, uh, 16 years each of them, they've never seen the mayor in their business. Uh, and both of them have run recogni won recognitions. No thank you, no support. Thank you. Okay. This is a really important issue because it really is part of how we not only keep the city affordable, how we have jobs, how we provide a way for people to earn a living. It's also the way that we can deal with our budget in terms of trying to create more commercial growth, which then provides us more resources. It also takes some of the strain off of residential property tax owners uh, by shifting it over to the commercial side. 
We don't have a lot of developable land in Northampton, but what we have, we really need to figure out a way to maximize. Again, as I said in my opening, one of the things I've done professionally is I was economic development director for John Holder. I worked with cities and towns all across western Massachusetts, talking to mayors, talking to chambers of commerce, talking to small businesses about what are the things we can do. I think for Northampton, one of the I, I think one of the things we have to do is have a more cohesive strategy. Um, you know, I've, I've been involved in other efforts in the city, whether it's uh, transportation, our energy, where we've put together uh, bodies to actually focus on these kinds of big issues for the city: the Transportation and Parking Commission, the Energy and Sustainability Commission. I've called for during the campaign putting together an economic development advisory committee where we bring in people from local businesses, we bring in uh, development experts, we bring in uh, small business owners and entrepreneurs and representatives from labor, and we try to really formulate a strategy so we can focus on the things that, uh, that Michael talked about, about you know, whether it's buy local or whether it's attracting green jobs, but trying to come up with that strategy. I also believe very firmly that we need to support our local businesses. I mean, I think one of the things the great character of Northampton is that we have so many local businesses. We still have independent bookstores which have been lost in so many other cities. We have the great um, arts and cultural life here. You know, we have the amazing uh, group of restaurants. And we have a lot of people, a lot of family businesses, which is also something that we're losing a lot in America. And so I think a big part of the jobs of the mayor is also to be supportive of that. And I've also been out in local businesses. I count many local businesses among my supporters. Um, and they know that I understand that one of the things we have to do is not only look for new entrepreneurs, but also support the businesses that we have here in the city. Um, out of the respect for the people lined up at the microphone, I'm going to yield my minute. Okay, okay good. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, David, your response first. Yes. David Corbett, a lifelong citizen of Northampton, and I appreciated what Smith College has done through the years. Not only the negative, but there's a lot of positives. Anyway, my question is with the CPA. I was active in getting it on the ballot question. And they say that there's a, an abatement for homeowners. But the thing is, is the renters of the city do not have the same opportunity. They uh, have $50,000 or whatever it is for homeowners, but the renters, if they make 20000 they don't get the chance to get the tax taken off. Or they have to pay it through their landlords. Is that fair? Well, I think that, I mean, that's, that's the nature of the property tax system in general, is that we, you know, we have this tax, we generate revenue based on property tax and property ownership. So even in our standard property tax system, um, people who are renters are not paying property taxes directly, but obviously, um, uh, presumably, it's getting paid for through the rents that they pay, and it's being passed on by their landlord. Um, so the same applies to the CPA. Uh, where you know we have this Community Preservation Act, which is a dedicated fund uh, that focuses on uh, open space preservation, historic preservation, um, uh, uh, recreation, and uh, missing the fourth one, it'll come to be affordable housing. Uh, and so this has been a mechanism where um, there's a surcharge on people's property taxes. So the same issue applies in terms of the abatements, in terms of all of those things, because people who are renting don't get a property tax bill. But I think it's understood that you know, this is just sort of the way the system works around property taxes. We still let people who rent vote on issues in the city and vote on issues around you know, our property taxes, raising property taxes, lowering them. And so I think it's the same system that applies when it comes to the CPA, that the whole community makes a decision on that. And whether you own or you rent, you still have a right to have a say about a major public policy issue affecting the future of the city. Um, I think the, uh, the CPA being on the ballot this year highlights that, that issue I was talking about earlier be, between the divide of the, the have a lots and the have a littles. And although the, 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 the fee, I, I think the, the average fee that I've heard is 78, 76 dollars per household. Um, I want to remind folks that the, the um, Occupy Wall Street movement was um, uh, ignited by a $5 a month fee, which in my math works out to $60, which is a little bit less than the average one. And I, I mention that because that means that working people are feeling the, the pinch really heavily. And the, uh, the CPA has been um, 
framed between uh, the progressives and conservatives. Again, I think that's a very de divisive way to look at it. It's between people who are really, really struggling and have to be uh, careful about every penny that they spend. And that some people, um, I don't think, really realize that or appreciate that. There's a lot of people who are in very, very difficult circumstances. So I was a big champion of the CPA the first time around. I helped to uh, uh, give the opportunity for voters to get it on the ballot. I think this time, and one of the things that we said is that people would have a, uh, an opportunity to re-examine and vote on it again, and that's part of, of the process. And I think it really comes down to uh, whether or not people feel like they can afford it. I think that's one of the, the major issues that are facing people. Just only to say again, I think the way the process is structured, that you know the fact that we put it on the ballot, it goes to before all the voters. I think even more reason, if you're concerned about this, that you want to make sure that people who are renters have a say in the process. That they, you know, the folks that are living in apartments, folks that uh, you know, don't own property, it still affects them because we're talking about funding that, that has major impacts on major community institutions, on on our land use planning, on recreation planning, on our affordable housing strategy. So again, I just think it's important that everybody have a say on it, um, and also that you know, people have the option to, to vote for or against. In terms of the exemptions, just to remind, you know, the first 100,000 of people's uh, property value is exempt, and then there are exemptions for low income as well as for elderly. So uh, Northampton, I'm proud that Northampton put the maximum exemptions to try to try to lessen some of that impact. But again, it's a decision that everybody has to make about if they think that this is something that they can afford and if they think it's valuable for the community as well. I'm more interested in hearing from the people. Next question, uh, Michael Owens. My name is Jasper, I'm from Ward 3. Um, my question is regarding uh, the, the conducting your campaign um, more specifically the candidate on my left, uh, but, but somewhat of both, it, involving playing the victim to some extent, like the comment about getting the raw deal and always complaining about the way uh, different elements of society are, are treating you, your kids, the campaign, etc. negative ads which happen in campaigns. Is that an acceptable way to manage your campaign and would that affect your uh, ability to serve as mayor? Thank you. Yeah, I don't think I've complained about it. I don't think I was asked a question about it, and I answered it fairly forthrightly. But I don't think you've heard me complaining about it. I mean, I, my my approach has been just to keep out, keep on doing the thing that I've been doing, which I've been receiving a really positive response to. So I'm not really sure this idea that I've been playing the victim. Uh, you know, I know that when those ads came out, there was a lot of commentary about it, and of course, it was great fodder for debate debate questions. But I've always tried to bring the issue back to. You know, what are the real issues that we have to deal with? You know, and what are my ideas? What's my vision? What are the solutions that I want to talk with people about? And how do we bring people together and unite people uh, to try to figure out you know, where we go forward? Um, so I'm not really sure what, uh, that I understand the question. And I don't think that's how I've uh, conducted myself. Well, thank you. Well, there has been a, a lot of talk about positive and who's positive, who's negative in the campaign. And I have. Um, I, I do not have a problem in um, identifying issues that I think uh, need to be addressed, even if they're unpopular. And um, some people can call that negative. I think sometimes you can get into a syndrome of the uh, what I call the Emperor's New Clothes Syndrome, where people don't want to admit that there, there's an issue that we can all see, but we're not going to put a name to it. So a lot of times I have done that, and I have been faulted, and I, I get the... Uh, uh, accusation of being negative, and, but I think putting that aside, I think we need to go and talk about, have a healthy discussion on the negative, agree to, uh, on the issues, agree to disagree, and uh, stop this negative, positive thing. Thank you. Um, Michael, you'll take the next question, please. Audi, Susco, Steve Susco, Bridge Road, Ward 1, citizen and taxpayer. Now this goes to character and problem identification and solving. Some two years ago now, I was forced to bring in, in a forcible manner to the, before our city council, a real problem, not abstract, 
sewage being forced multiple times into my home. Our city's response to, at that time ranged from no response to humor at me as a victim. Please recall I challenged both of you as our city's leadership for assistance when the smoke cleared and the dust settled. Only Mr. Bardley responded, only Mr. Bardsley helped. Please respond. I see this as going to your personal characters and problem identification and solving. Thank you. The, uh, Mr. Susco did come before the city council on uh, three separate occasions, and I remember, uh, and obviously the council meets on a uh, Thursday evening, and I was still working at that time, and that was a very busy Friday, so I did not get back to him on that Friday, uh, did not get back to him over the weekend, sometime during the week, and I anticipated that I would be uh, the last of several people who had already called him. And when I said I apologize for being yet another call uh, that he had to answer and, and talk about the issue, he said, Mr. Bogsley, you are wrong. <laughs> you are the only person who has, has called. And I, prior to that, Stephen, I, um, I did not know him. And so I started working with him. Um, he has been very uh, vocal, or he was vocal at some city council meetings. And because I associated with him, and um, a lot of people use that association that against me, quite frankly, the last time, and I have it in writing. People send me emails. Um, whether or not you like Mr. Stesco's uh, tone of voice or his style, he still had a legitimate problem, and you need to get beyond that and work with him. And I thought it was reprehensible that nobody else in city government e even responded to his concern on three different times when he had sewage backing up into his cellar. And um, so I responded. I am proud of the fact that I, was, that I did respond. And I, was the only, I did not know I was the only one until I, until I uh, had the initial conversation. Thank you. Yeah, so I um, uh, appreciate Mr. Susco's question. At the time that Mr. Susco was having his problem, he lives in, in Ward um, 1, I believe it is. And I was the Ward 4 city councilor. And we have, uh, you know, every citizen has two at-large city councilors and their ward councilor. And at the time that that issue happened, I conferred, I did talk to my uh, colleague in Ward 1, um, and, and she indicated that, you know, she was aware of it and that she had had conversations with him. So uh, that was the situation in that case where I wasn't actually his ward councilor. And typically what we do is we defer to people that are the ward councilor. I can say, though, that since being at-large counselor, um, I have worked with Mr. Susco on issues and problems that have related to him and to issues affecting his neighborhood. And I think we've worked quite well together on them. We worked together on a major issue concerning uh, truck traffic in the area and the use of engine compression brakes. And I think we collaborated really well on that. Um, and, uh, and, and then we've also, I've also worked, again, in his, in his role as counselor, as at-large counselor, um, on some issues related to some roadway resurfacing issues. And I think, um, I'm hoping that he would agree that I was somebody that was very responsive in my role as representing him as an at-large counselor and worked with him, and, and I think we had a really good working relationship. So, again, I think I can work with anybody in the city, um, uh, and I can reach out to people and work with them on issues. And those are two examples of where I've worked with him on two particular issues. I haven't made a big thing about it, I haven't talked about it, or, or, or made it part of a, you know, any of these debates, but it's just something that I did and it's part of my role, and that's always been my role. If I represent a neighborhood or a community, I'm going to respond to those concerns. It just at the time that that initial thing happened, I wasn't actually his city councilor. Um, there were three other people who represented him. Should we move to the next question? Okay, please. Hi, my name is Laura Curran. I moved here in 1991 to attend Smith College. So I'm very grateful for this um, gathering here and for the leadership from the students who put it on. Yay. Um, my question is about leadership. And what I would like to hear from both the candidates is you've both been city council president. And can you share with us some specific things that you were able to do as um, president of city council to move issues forward in the city? Thanks. 
I think one of the things that I that I've tried to do in the time that I've been city council is really work on uh, work on our, our process as a legislative body. There were a lot of concerns prior to that about the relationship between the executive and the legislature. I I'm somebody who worked in the legislature, uh, you know, in my background, so I really care deeply about this issue about the, the proper separation of government and how our process works. So I did a lot of work when I first became city council president to look at our rules, to work with our new members especially, uh, conducted workshops on how our procedures work so that everybody would be on the same page and we'd understand that. I've also worked at how can we um, uh, upgrade and change our, our, the way that our process accesses the public. So in, for one small example is, you know, at our meetings, trying to make sure that people have access to all of our agendas by displaying them on the screen. Simple things like the timing system, which for years had been a, had been a great uh, source of rancor in terms of people not feeling like they had a fair time. We devised a really simple response, which was put a timer up there so everybody could see the time, the speakers could see the time. Um, I've also worked on when we get into complex issues, big issues, to try to put together public forums, to try to bring, to get, take it outside of the more formal legislative process and try to put together public forums on big issues whether it's the war dollars, um, whether it's some of the stuff around the landfill, to try to put together some issues around that. Um, and I've also tried to be very res responsive to all of the city councilors and to work with every city council. I've, I've worked with, on just, I think I've worked with every city councilor on one issue or another. Uh, and in some cases it's been helping them draft legislation, in other cases it's been um, actually co-sponsoring stuff with them. I feel very strongly that as a, as a member of the city council, as a president, that it's my job to help everybody. Whether we disagree or agree on issues, um, there's always ways we can find common ground to work together. And I think if you look at all the city councilors that we've worked with, um, that's going to be a, a common story that you're going to hear about my style as a leader. Thank you. Uh, the, uh when the city council has been dealing with uh, major issues, it has been a long history that we have uh, forums that deal with those specific issues. That isn't anything new. I go back to the uh, um, the, the domestic partnership ordinance where we had many a uh, forum on that, and there's been other issues in the past too. So that that's not a new feature. Um, in terms of working with it, with councilors, I've worked with. Uh, successfully with a wide range of councils, even with differences. A, um, a councilor, former city councilor, uh, Ray LaBarge, had a, some differences with me at a period of time, and we had, uh, he had some issues and disagreements. Um, we had a very rough relationship. I did not hold that against him at all, and came full circle. We worked together on a number of issues. He voted for me at the end for city council president. And I was uh, honored that through his request, his family asked me to participate in his, his funeral services. So um, it, I think that shows that I, I don't let small differences become uh, between me and my colleagues. But if, using examples of, of uh, leadership, um, I would say the formation of the Human Rights Commission. When I came aboard, I noticed that was an issue, uh, issue in the city, that there wasn't a forum. I was a person who stepped forward, did the research, and proposed that. Um, I was one of two councillors responsible, along with Marianne Labarge, with the, uh, the ballot referendum of the landfill expansion to give the voters a, a chance to weigh in on that. Um, I did the, a lot of the early work and the leadership that resulted in the uh, skateboard park. I was one of the early leaders, along with uh, Ray LaBarge, for the rail trails, and that are very popular now, but we were the two councils who did the initial work on that. I did the, uh, I was the point person for the architectural review committee downtown, and also, as well as the demolition delay ordinance. So a number of controversial issues I took the lead on. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have time, I think, for two more questions, followed by the candidate's closing statements. Hello, my name is Samana. Uh, rather than say a ward, I'd like to say I'm a citizen at large. Uh, I'm a simple monk. I live here in Northampton. We distribute many things to many people who are in need. I'm one of the people who is very involved in Occupy Northampton and have been involved in, I would say, this kind of work. You can make it that what you will for much of my life. I'd like to hear each of you candidates speak about 
Occupy Northampton. I've spoken with each of you separately, privately. Speak to the group here about Occupy Northampton, about Occupy Together, this global movement, and an extraordinary need. Many of us, 99%, believe for change. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I think the Occupy movement in general is probably one of the most significant things that has happened politically uh, recently, and um, I applaud it. I, it is showing that people are uh, very concerned with how uh, the economic uh, policies are impacting their lives and they are tired of saying old politics and that they have taken to the streets in a very uh, peaceful yet forceful way to make their point. So um, uh, to me that is a very, very powerful movement and it shows what many of us have been saying for some time, that the working middle class is really being whacked, and a lot of it has to do with corporate greed. Um, in terms of uh, the specific occupying Northampton, I have been down to the park on a uh, couple of occasions. I attended one of the meetings. I have spoken with a number of individuals. I'm very concerned with the, uh, the treatment that um, those folks who were in the park um, uh, had from the city, they had uh, a notif notification late on a Thursday night, somewhere between six and seven, that they could stay in the park, and it was beginning to rain, and they were told they could stay in the park um, overnight, but they couldn't have tents. So they weren't being evicted, but they were having the shelter taken away from them. Um, and it was explained they needed a permit, um, and that was the first time that that had been presented to them. So I think we could do a lot better when we're dealing with people who are using uh, the, the uh, democratic process to make a statement and make, um, and make a complaint or make a, a point. And I think the uh, treatment that we gave them would, um, had a lot of room for improvement. I also believe that the, uh, you know, the Occupy Wall Street and then the, the, the um, corresponding spread of that throughout the country is a really significant and important thing. And I think in, in many ways it reflects the feeling in the country that, you know, we had this giant economic crisis, um, most of which was caused by, uh, you know, uh, lax regulations, by people that were speculating, by people that were, you know, doing a lot of things like, uh, you know, subprime mortgages, um, and that the response of the government is, to date has been, uh, to how do we deal with this economic crisis has not been to look at those root causes, to look at you know uh, big business, to look at big banks, to look at uh, to not even prosecute a single person around the issue of these mortgages, uh, and then contrasting that with the fact that we have millions of people who are underwater on mortgages, we have millions of people that are out of work, we have millions of people that don't have health insurance, uh, you know we have millions of people uh, that are in involved in. Uh, uh, employee unions around the country that are seemingly under attack uh, by government. Um, so I think that that's really what it reflects is the feeling that, you know, wait a minute here, uh, you know, what's the solution going to be and what, how's government going to help sort of the 99% of us that's really feeling the, the worst effects of this economic crisis. So I think that that's a very valid thing. In terms of Northampton, um, I too have gone down and visited uh, not only the, the, where the protests have happened, but I have attended one of the General Assembly meetings. And today I actually welcomed a group from um, um, Occupy Northampton in the, in the mayor's office, the acting mayor's office, to talk with them about some of these logistical issues that we're having, which are very common that are happening around the country because we have a policy in our public parks of no camping. Uh, that's been a policy that's been in effect for many, many, many years. Um, and so I, I pledged to them that I would try to work with, on their behalf, to, to be a liaison to the police department, to the DPW, to try to figure out what kind of a solution we can come up with. And whether or not that involves coming up with a solution in Pulaski Park, or trying to find uh, another space that they could do camping, similar to what ha is happening in New York, where they're in a private Leon Park. Um, maybe it's on the Smith College campus, I'm not sure. Uh, but maybe we can find a solution. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one last question. I'm asking to keep the question brief, because we're really running no short problem. time. Uh, the best, it goes along the same lines. The Best Practices Committee recommended an independent review of the Planning and Development Office. Can you, gentlemen, uh, comment on the status of that review? David. 
Yes. Uh, so there was a, a report that came out and, and had a series of recommendations. I was part of the committee that made it. One of those recommendations was this idea of the review of the planning department. Right when the report came out was also a time that we were having the, the, uh, the whole issue of the budget crisis in the city in terms of what we were going to be able to afford. Um, and so one of the issues was how could we pay for such a review? Um, it turns out that the planning department is going to be going through sort of a reaccreditation process, and I think that may be an opportunity for us to be able to look at how our planning department functions. Uh, we have made some changes to the planning department since that practice, best practices report came out that I supported. One of them was dividing up the economic, the community and economic development functions of the planning department away from the general planning department. I think one of the issues that came up during the hotel debate was we had the same staff that was um, advising the developer on the hotel also in charge of the regulatory process. So I supported dividing the two functions and creating a separate office uh, so that we divided the economic development function from the planning function. I think that's been a good thing. I think we do have to, it, I, I would like to take up those recommendations. It's been the funding that's been an issue in terms of can we afford to do that kind of a review. But I do think that the reaccreditation process of our planning department, where we have outside people coming in to look at how it functions and look at how it's performing, I think that gives us an opportunity to do that um, and to really take a look at how our planning uh, operation functions in the city. So that would be one way that I would try to approach uh, dealing with that particular recommendation. Thank you, Michael. The, uh, the report that was issued by the Best Practices Committee had 10 recommendations, and some of those recommendations, one or two of them, have had a lot of work done on them. Some of them had, have had uh, sporadic work done on them, and three of them, um, so far, there's been little evidence of a, a lot of work done or any work done on them. And, um, one of the handouts that I have at my table is a, a, um, a progress report, being the teacher that I am, in terms of the work that has been done on all those recommendations. Um, that one was one of the, uh, the recommendations that had a lot of uh, public input. People were very, very uh, concerned, had a lot to say about the operations of the planning department and how effective it is and how it treats people and how, the, how clear the, um, their decision-making process is or isn't. And I think it's a really, really um, important issue that we make, uh, we should have made some uh, movement on it uh, before now, and we have to make that a, as a priority. Um, I have spoken with folks who are developers who live in Northampton who will not develop in this community, they'll go elsewhere. Uh, one of the communities they go to is Greenfield. And in Greenfield, they assign a, uh, a staff person that's five, one of five, people who are qualified and, and to do the work. They work with that developer that and works, uh, takes them through the process, walks them through the process, makes it very user-friendly. There's nothing like that that happens in this community. A lot of the people have to solve things for themselves, spend a lot of money. It's perceived as being very unfriendly for developers. So that's why we need to do a review of the department. We need to do it as quickly as possible. Thank you. Okay, we're now going to proceed to closing statements. Each candidate has two minutes. David Markowitz will start, followed by Michael Barson. Well, I want to begin by thanking Professor Gold and all of the organizers again for putting on tonight's debate, and for all of you for coming out and listening, and for all the great questions that you offered. Um, throughout the proceeding. I also want to say a special thank you to my wife, Yella, who's uh, sat through many of these debates, and, and our daughters, Emma and Zoe, at home uh, for their constant love and support. Northampton is an excellent place to live, to learn, to work, to run a business, and to raise a family. I'm running for mayor because I want to keep Northampton strong, and I want to make it better. During my three terms on the city council, I've been a positive and productive representative and leader. I've never shied away from tough issues or hard work, I brought people together to create innovative solutions and tangible results to improve our community. Since announcing my candidacy, I've knocked on hundreds of doors and sat in dozens of kitchens and living rooms across the city, listening and sharing ideas, and discussing my vision for how we can create economic opportunity and jobs, how we can keep our city livable and affordable, 
how we can maintain strong public schools, and how we can deliver smart, cost-effective city services, how we can protect our environment and keep Northampton green and sustainable, how we can foster active neighborhood participation, and how we can have a government that is open, fair, and transparent. This election is a critical one for our city and presents a stark choice. There will always be real disagreements on issues. The question is, how do we resolve them? Are we going to be stuck in the past, pointing fingers and dwelling on old fights and differences? Or can we choose to look forward, to talk about the future of our city, and decide how to work together to reach our shared goals? Northampton needs a mayor with a vision and a steady, proven track record of leadership and results. A mayor who will unite our city and work hard every day for all of its people to find innovative solutions to the challenges we face. I am the candidate with the experience, the ideas, the energy, and the commitment to offer a new generation of leadership to move our great city forward. Thank you again for being here tonight, and I hope I can earn your vote for mayor on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers of uh, tonight's forum, and thank you um, to those of you who came tonight and have stayed to the end. I appreciate that. Uh, a question that has been asked more than once uh, during this debate season, and I believe it was the first question you heard this evening, is what differentiates you from your opponent? And I'm happy to address that question because I think it's a very easy one. First, experience. Uh, I have 33 years as a professional educator in the Amherst Public Schools and over 20 years as a public servant in city government. Second, leadership. Not only was I city council president for eight years, but I have a solid track record as an advocate for quality public education. In 1999, I earned from the Northampton Teachers Association their Friend of Education Award, for example. I've been a champion of human and civil rights, and as a union leader, I've been a tireless advocate on labor-related issues. Each of us, um, a, another thing I would ask you to do, and I'm streamlining my remarks, is to compare our literature. I think our literature is very reflective of us in our different campaigns. They really make different statements. Take each of them and read them carefully, please. I would also suggest that you talk to our supporters. I have spoken to people I know very well. We live in a small community who are supporting David. And when I've asked them why, I have heard, and these are all words that have been said to me, David is a centrist, and I'm too um, associated with those who are disaffected or disaffiliated. He's a defender of the status quo, an insider who can get things done behind the scenes. And my favorite is David sounds most like a lawyer. I will um, present to you that I am the most likely the agent for change to make the changes that our city needs. I ask for your support on November 8th. Thank you. Please join me in thanking both candidates for what I think was a very important <laughs>